Hi everyone, and welcome back to the video series, An Introduction to Land Administration. I'm Tabo Fukani, and in this video, we will be discussing cadastral systems and land tenure information systems. Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Hull. In the previous three videos, we had Rosalie presenting the land rights continuum, Chepo presenting land tenure security, and I presented on land information systems and the cadaster. If you missed those videos, now might be a good time to press pause on this one and go back to watch the previous videos. This video continues where the previous one left off and expands our understanding of the cadaster and land information system. And I'm Dr. Rosalie Kingwell. In the previous video, Simon emphasized that the cadaster forms the basis for land administration systems. We are by now aware that conventional notions of the cadaster overlook rights that are not registered. Since these represent the majority of rights in South Africa, and in fact in other African countries, this is a very serious flaw in the system. Absolutely. And there's still a tension between Western law-based concepts of property, law, and rights, as compared to those based on customary conceptions. The latter have emerged and evolved from indigenous African systems of property in post-colonial societies. Since they do not pass through a registration system, but are administered locally, they are thus quite varied. So a cadastral system combines the spatial cadaster with the land record that registers rights or interests. Cadastral systems link people uh, to land. And the cadaster is the glue that links the spatial component to the rights held by people to land. Both the spatial and social or textual components are legitimated by either statutory means or by social processes. Cadastral systems also support the valuation and taxation of land and the administration of present and potential future uses of land. A cadastral system that supports all the modern functions of land administration is known as a multi-purpose cadaster, as it interconnects all the component parts we've discussed earlier. And it thus plays the critical role of linking and interconnecting the land-related functions in the economy and society. So let's return to the question of whether the three elements of the cadaster I presented in the previous video apply to off-register, so-called informal or customary land tenure types. The elements are demarcation of boundaries, evidence for dispute resolution, professional survey. And we can also think of the imperatives which were place, stability, and economy. What do you think, ladies? Well, in informal or customary systems, the first two elements are often present but the professional survey is definitely absent. In the case that boundaries are identified by local witnessing and by lower level technologies, such as tape measures and pacing, or by general boundaries, which include natural features such as river, bush, rock, fence, or wall. Hence, there is an element of reliable evidence for boundary demarcation and dispute resolution. Yes, Chepo. So it's conceivable that unregistered customary land rights are in reality recorded in a cadastral system of sorts, albeit some of the information is provided by oral evidence or local witnessing and by natural features. Such off-register cadastral systems could contain all the elements of registered formalized cadastral systems using methods and instruments appropriate to their given context. I agree. A cadastral system should not be understood to refer exclusively to formalized systems of property rights, but may refer to non-exclusive customary property rights to according to African customary law. The three elements and imperatives may apply to both formal and customary or informal cadastral systems. In the latter, the third element, professional administration, is replaced by customary administration with different forms of evidence. Thanks, Simon. This is a critically important paradigm shift in understanding cadastral systems. What you're actually saying is that off-register, informal, or customary tenure scenarios 
may actually be included in a broader understanding of the cadaster? Yep, that's right. And this is a necessary understanding for adopting an expanded, inclusive approach to land administration, as we are advocating for in this course. It's also in keeping with the shift in focus from land information systems to land tenure information systems. And Chepo, I'll let you take us through that one. Land tenure information system. Land information systems can integrate multiple data sets related to land. We already know that the cadastra contains information on the location of land parcels. This might be stored as coordinates defining the corners of the properties in a Cartesian plane, or as a geometrical description of the length of the sides and the angles at the corners of the parcel. To that basic evidence, based on surveyed measurements, is added social information on the holders of rights, such information like the people or group who holds rights and the types of rights they hold. This is the evidence that is usually stored in the deeds registry. In addition, the national census captures multiple different types of information related to a land parcel or location, including the numbers of people living in a household and the materials of which the building is constructed, Aerial and satellite imageries can be analyzed to determine the size and number of dwellings at a location or the different types of land cover, such as natural vegetation, agricultural land, industrial areas, etc. There are also digital elevation models, meaning three-dimensional measurements that provide information on the height of the ground and the structures above a recognized datum, usually this is mean sea level. We have stressed throughout this series that the conventional descriptions based on professionally surveyed plots do not fit the majority of South Africans' land information. Not everyone lives on neatly surveyed and demarcated cadastral land parcels. In informal settlements and in communal land situations, land parcels may overlap and boundaries and use rights may change over time. Under customary tenure, different members of the community or family have differentiated rights to different parts of the commons and the boundaries of the commons shift seasonally. In such situations, land information is unlikely to be computerized, but may be stored in the collective memories of the community concerned. These kinds of situations are also very difficult to computerize and thus may be recorded as narrative evidence, as some new tools are currently doing. The link between people, land, and rights nevertheless represents information on land that forms the basis for land administration. Mike Barry and Lanny Roo have proposed a shift from a land information system toward a land tenure information system, instead, focusing on the physic, instead of focusing only on the physical and mathematical aspects of land information, it emphasizes the relationships between people with respect to the land. Fisher and Whittle take up this idea when they write that a land tenure information system brings together technology and data, which, when combined effectively, provide information on land holding rights, interests, and tenure, the extent and duration of these, and the information of the rights holder or data subjects. It emphasizes relationships between stakeholders rather than simply presenting the land administration system as a value-free and apolitical system. The emphasis on relationships means that both formal land administration systems as well as a range of off-register land records are included. Evidence such as oral histories and other communally held information that provides a witness to rights and boundaries is included in a broader concept of a land information system. This approach is in keeping with the recommendations of the Presidential Advisory Panel on Land Reform and Agriculture, which endorsed advocacy for a single national data portal for all land-related information. This would greatly increase the accessibility and transferability of land information, vastly improving 
land governance and administration. In this session, we introduced land governance, land tenure, land rights, the cadastral system, and the land information system as critical integrated components of the land administration system. And we stressed how they must be interconnected for effective land administration. These elements feed into every level of the land administration system. Land administration systems operate within a context of land governance that determines the effectiveness of the implementation of land policy goals and land management strategies. To encourage their success, we suggest that the top-down state reform initiatives should meet the bottom-up grassroots mobilizations in a context of democratic land governance, wherein multiple stakeholders' views can be expressed and respected. That sounds exactly like the solution. And we also highlighted that land rights describe what can be done with land, such as occupation, agriculture, access and transfer, as well as restricting others from doing the same. Land tenure describes how the right is held. It might be held through a verbal agreement between parties or an understanding that is shared by a community or more formally in the form of a deed of lease or title. These rules or terms and conditions pertaining to land rights usually include responsibilities and restrictions associated with the exercise of the right. For example, in an urban residential area, you may occupy your dwelling, but you may not use it as a business without necessary permission. In a communal setting, you may occupy your dwelling, so long as you observe the customs and the traditions of that area. We also introduced you to the concept of the cadaster as the foundation of land administration and an element of the broader land information system, which feeds information into all levels of the land administration system. Information is power and effective land administration systems operate on shared and up-to-date information. It's important to highlight that the information flow is both top down in the form of policies and government gazettes, etc., as well as bottom up in the form of vital feedback from citizens, communities, and civil society regarding the successes and failures of land administration on the ground. A responsive government would heed such feedback and adjust their strategies accordingly to ensure sustained future successes. In the next session, we look at some approaches for hopefully achieving this.